Welcome to uh, the race recap with Big Mike and the Pixie. Uh, today we're going to be interviewing uh, Becca Kawaoka and uh, second place. Yeah, Yay! second place <laughs> right. minister in her age group at the uh, female thirty to thirty four world champion. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, thanks. <laughs> welcome, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you today. Thank you. I'm so excited to talk to you guys. It's been awesome just kind of getting to know you a little bit on social media and kind of being close to you guys in the area too. You're in Idaho and I'm in Seattle, Washington area. So we're we're close. I think we get to do kind of a lot of the same races too. So I'm sure we'll bump into each other quite a bit now that we've got a name to the face here. So that's cool. Yeah. Thanks for having exactly. me. Absolutely. So what we're doing on this um, podcast is just kind of trying to connect um, anybody who's interested or is looking for some additional inspiration. Um, we do a little race recap from St. George 70.3 World Championship. So if anybody's interested in St. George in general or is just kind of interested about the race, we're going to do a little rundown about how it went for you since it was so wildly different for each individual and then kind of hearing what makes you tick to do what you do at such a phenomenal level. So um, let's kind of start just kind of an intro. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what do you do, some of your crowning achievements. Uh, yeah, so I'm a personal trainer is how I started kind of getting into the fitness world. I've always loved fitness. Um, I grew up in a small farm town in Illinois in the Midwest, and it was all about football. So I started, you know, weight training with the football team and... Oh. Yeah, I kind of got into soccer as the sport that I played through high school and club and college. And uh, they kind of snagged me on the track just for one year. They wanted me to run the 800 for them with like zero training. So I did that for one year um, and just, you know, majored in exercise science and started personal training. So I've been doing that shoot for about 12 years, 11, 12 years now. It makes me sound wow. old, but I know. <laughs> um, and then moved to Arizona because I got sick of the Midwestern winners. And that's where I met my husband, who's been doing Ironman and half Ironman for the last 15 years. Um, so I kind of got in, involved just with triathlons through the gyms that I were, was working at there. I was like, what are these people talking about? Like swimming and, and cycling and running. So kind of got into a good crowd uh in Arizona there and married my husband uh before Ooh. moving up here but yeah I think I wrote one of my crowning achievements was staying married to him so that's been mm -hmm. uh, you know a big big plus with all the Iron Man training you know you can get pretty cranky when you're training a lot so I think that's I've, of anything that I wrote down in the response that comes to mind uh staying married through training is one of them <laughs> So yeah, certainly relate. Do you guys train together? Are you kind of by yeah. the training room? How does that work together? Yeah, that training room gets really hot that I was just showing you guys. Uh, we don't have air conditioning in our house. I don't know about y'all, but um, we're just side by side. So we'll bike next to each other there and it gets we have and then we have a sauna in there too. So it gets up to like you know, in the winter, it's fine. But in the summertime, if we don't go outside, you know, it's like 90 to 100 degrees in there when we're training. So we usually indoors, we follow different workouts, but we're both on Zwift. So sometimes we'll do like a Zwift race together. Um, and in the springtime, I will do a lot of his long Ironman training rides with him. I'll just kind of sit on his wheel and occasionally pull if he gets like super smoked. But um, unless we're doing like a three hour or less ride, uh, I don't, I don't take too many pulls at the front because I just get too <laughs> tanked. So, uh, before Oregon 70.3, we did a flat route where I was able to put some pretty good pulls in up front and just kind of, kind of feel out what I was going to do at Oregon, which is a pretty flat course. Um, and he was pretty impressed by that. Uh, but when it comes to Hills, I mean, he's about my size I mean, he can just drop me like a bad habit. So, um, uh, we do do master's practices together. If our coach, because we both obviously are triathletes, she'll, if she wants a real triathlon specific set, she'll put us in the same lane. Uh, but he's, he's a good like 10 to 15 seconds, you know, T pace faster than me. So it kind of doesn't always work out. Um, and then he will do long runs occasionally with me, but track, track workouts, it works really well when he's Ironman training and I'm half Ironman training because he'll do like, you know, mile repeats and I'll just jump in for maybe an 800 recover, eight, you know, where he can do, hold that pace for a mile or so. So 
Um, it kind of depends on what the training block is. There is, there are times when he's like, I can't do the speed that you're doing because I'm Ironman training. Um, so there was a time where he was like, it's just too fast and too hard for me. So, uh, yes. And I would say, I would say 20% of our training time is together. If I had to put a rough estimate on it. Yeah. That's what you mentioned. You guys have the same coach. Uh, he's my coach and then he's self coach actually. So he can adjust his workouts a little bit more easily, but yeah, he okay. hasn't worked with a coach for like three or four years now. So I guess kind of in a way, since he's my coach, I guess you can call it that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah the same coach. <laughs> but masters, I'm sorry, you you are correct. We do have this, we, we go to the same masters practices. So our master's coach is the same. Yes. Okay. So it does have a different You're amazing. for swimming, right? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Swimming. That's incredible that you can take co take coaching advice for your husband. Mike's like, you should do this. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's okay. In some ways, it works really easily because I don't have to do nearly as much. Like, I don't know how you are with it, but you don't have to. You know how long it takes to write comments on Training Peaks? Yeah. I just be like, here's how it went. And unless it's something where I need to look back to remember, most of it's just to the two of us talking. So I guess in a lot of ways, it's convenient, but. There are times when I have good female friends I need to reach out to and just be like, this is not okay. This is ridiculous training and I hate it. And it's because he's trying to kill me. So <laughs> <laughs> pros and cons, pros and cons. <laughs> well, I, I think that's incredible that you're able like, you know, I think some people go, how do you guys work together? And I'm like, I love it. So I can understand how, you know, whatever makes you tick, right? Right. Yeah. And I mean, the, the fact so that... <laughs> Yeah. And the fact that Mike understands you and you're racing, I mean, typically Elliot and I do all the same races together, uh, my husband. So what's challenging for us in a race dynamic is that uh, if he's racing, I don't have anyone to help me on the course. So like, obviously at Oregon, when I was in, you know, I was leading a race, you know, had a lead cyclist with me. I mean, I was really, that was really unfortunate because just no one told me somebody was running really fast behind me. And even even on Ironman tracker, the last like 700 split, you could tell I was still in the lead. I just had no one to tell me that someone was moving up on me. So she ended up beating me by just like, a handful of seconds. So if he would have been spectating, you know, he would have been able to help me out a little bit there. But if you don't have somebody that you know, and that knows the sport, like my aunt was out there, she's like, yeah, go. And I was like, why didn't you tell me that that was happening? You know what I mean? So <laughs> there's a network of husbands out there. <laughs> I need to find this network. <laughs> there it is. I Mike, Mike and I have done this and I've recruited other people's husbands. I'm like, I understand you're here for your wife, but this is really important to me. <laughs> I need to, I'm going to, that's good to know. <laughs> outsource these people. You know, these, we'll, we'll have, that'll be the next thing Mike and I do is create an organization. Husbands of wives and triathlon and be like we will pay you to give us split no, there's got to be an app mindset for this like an app for that you know like a whatsapp for just somebody that needs a course scout you know yes exactly that's something that is we're on to something but write that down yeah before we get off into this crazy tangent how about you tell our viewers a little bit about how you got into triathlons uh yeah just yeah through the gym that i was at yeah yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. people were talking about, it, and then I went and watched an Ironman Arizona finish in 2016, mm -hmm. and I saw like the midnight finishers, and I was like, this. I mean, it sounds awful, but if these people can do it, I mean, I can do it. You know, there were people that were older and you know heavy set, or just you know parents out there, and I was like, if these people can make time to do this, I mean, I should be able to. But I also knew I had the wherewithal to know to sign up for a half Ironman first, so. <laughs> That that was a good thing. I think that was smart in hindsight. So just yeah, I think the the fitness crowd got me into it. Yeah. So did you start at the half distance, the Olympic sprint? I did. Yeah. So I signed up. I, so Ironman Arizona was always in November. I signed up for the the following year. Um, August was uh, Boulder seventy point three, and then just kind of getting to know my husband through that time. We were just dating. He was like you do need to work with a coach. Uh, you're way too much of a beginner for me. I don't want to deal with all of that. So here's a good beginner to coach. I know. And okay. she had me start with, um, she, she had me sign up for a sprint, but then my husband last minute, the morning of the race asked if I could switch to the Olympic just cause he wanted to see how terribly I would do. And I did tear. I mean, I did terribly. Like I should send you, I should send you the picture of me. I'm like, 
I was doing transition. He didn't tell me how to do anything. I was walking with my helmet and my bike shoes and I was running onto the bike course. He's like, you got to get on your bike, like put everything on. And he's just filming me doing the whole thing. I was like, traumatized. Uh, so I did. Yeah, I think I did two Olympics and then I have Ironman the next year. Yeah. You know, I do think, honestly, I think that some of my fondest memories are going back. Like, you know, I remember my first triathlon and like, I remember mine too. And there's some of my fondest memories. I was like, oh my God, how could I have done? I did my first half Ironman in like those little Nike spanky shorts. I rode my gosh. Cute. Bike. <laughs> I was chafing so bad. I lost like 20 pounds during the race because I thought it was like a brilliant way to lose weight, except I just died. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like anything goes. And I, I, I remember laying out before that race, I remember laying out like a cycling jersey. And he's like, if you get in the water now, you're going to blow up like a diaper. And I'm like, I'm surprised he didn't let me do it. I'm so surprised he didn't just let me like figure that part out. I'm glad he saved me from that. But my husband's a total like hard ass about things. He's like, learn it the hard way. and You'll never make that mistake again. I'm not going to hold your hand, girlfriend. So throw, throw me to the wolves. I, I think that's good. I mean, I told, I remember Mike did the Honu in Hawaii and I was like, babe, you've got to like, you know, when you're swimming up out, you want to swim as far as you can before you like running in the water because running out of the water is difficult. So he ru runs out with his wave of swimmers and he just starts swimming like immediately. He like drops down to the water and starts swimming and all everybody's running past him. <laughs> <laughs> so who got into in and out <laughs> well i'm curious who got into triathlons first or do you guys get into it together i did first he did bodybuilding but got it. Um, we'll we'll do something later to talk about me and mike's crazy journey but yeah we're, good good we're or we can call each other later <laughs> yeah that's fine that's fine yeah <laughs> But, um, okay, so we got you, Arizona inspired you. I also got into triathlon that way. But let's talk about the main event. Let's talk about St. George. Let's talk about everything because I feel like, you know, the cancel, like, tell me, walk me through all the feelings, all the weather, walk me through everything. Yeah. Um, I, I really, I had a lot of emotion on invested into this race because uh two years ago I started placing overall at races so I was like well you know it's one thing to place overall at a regular Ironman event obviously it's huge for a lot of people that's that's a goal and that was that was mine for there at the beginning and um you know early on my husband's like you know worlds are going to be in the U.S. and that's what I want you to focus on so it's been kind of a two-year journey for me getting here and um I I just don't love travel I, I'd not I don't travel very well at all I don't know if it's the farm girl in me or what but I have a hard time crossing time zones and flying and such so just you know I I, I, I don't know if I'd have been able to perform well overseas at like a Nice or a New Zealand or anything like that so for me having a race in the U.S. was a huge blessing and something I was really excited about um a month out when they told us the days were going to be combined, I was like, okay, no big deal. That's how all the races are. And my husband kind of chuckled and didn't say anything. <laughs> and, and one of my good friends was like, how are you not upset about this? I was like, well, yeah, everyone's just going to line up and it's going to be like every other day. And my husband goes, you know, there's about, you know, 4,000 athletes that are going to be racing. I was like, wow, I better find a spot at the front. You know, some, something kind of, something kind of like naive, you know, cause I've never done a world championship event. I don't know how they really work. Um, and so the week before when we got the wave starts, I had a complete meltdown. <laughs> I did. I called my dad just swearing. I called my mother-in-law just, I had drank like half a bottle of wine. I was like, what am I going to do? I'm going to do terribly at this and it's going to be non-wetsuit and I'm just, everything got went out the window there. But, um, you know, my husband knows Lindsay Corbin really well. She's a pro. I'm, I'm sure you know her in, in the area and she's like, just stay calm, whatever. You're going to be fine drink a lot of water and just, you'll be fine. So after the, after 24 hours of anger at Ironman for kind of giving the girls the shaft, 
I was like, whatever, it's your first world, just, just try to take in the day, and everything after that just kind of was focused on the actual race, so that was upsetting, and, you know, I've, I don't know how you guys were, but I, you know, obviously sent an email, and have, have still been in email correspondence with them, and one of my actual current athletes knows somebody that owns, is one of the, on the ownership board, you know, a financial company that owns them, so he's like, if you need me to put in a word, you know, let me know. So I'm like, that's going to be my next call today. So, you know, I'm more for future generations. I think it's important that if you say it's going to be a two day event, go ahead and keep it at a two day event. Like that's the main thing. And then if you are going to change things around, make sure it's equal treatment. Cause that's one thing I love about triathlon. It is a fairly equal sport if you think about it. So I don't know why that should change, you know, pro fields have equal prize purses. So so yeah, there was some anger in there, and then race week, I was really nervous going into it. I was, you know, you just think of, I didn't sleep well the whole week. I was just, you know, not really sleeping well, and and uh, yeah, on race morning when they made the call about non wetsuit, I don't know about you, I'm not a great swimmer, um, but I really, it's gonna, this is the only girly thing about me. I was like, my swim swimsuit looks really good on me. I think it's really cute. So I was like, I'm kind of excited to wear my new swim skin, um, and I kind of was excited that would be hard, but. Um, I love the I love the course and I love the experience. Um, and it was really fun coming out of the water and you were like booking through transition. Like I was just like trying to get my swim skin off. Like I had a shoelace tied to it and I couldn't get the shoe. I couldn't get the shoelace. As soon as I ripped it, the whole shoelace came off in my hand. So I was kind of processing that. And then you come booking by, I'm like, well, she's obviously competitive, so I should probably get my shit together. So I don't lose sight of her. Um, and that's just, that stands out a lot in my mind. And then obviously the bike course with you was really uh, a huge highlight for me. And the run was awful. So <laughs> this is like oh, really hard. So that's it in a nutshell, I would say. So if you want to break down anything from that, but that's the initial shock through the race experience for me. Yeah, I, uh, I definitely understand all of that. Um, <laughs> Um, and I've done a handful of world championships before when they were combined in the future and then when they separated for men and women. And, you know, I actually, it's funny because when they first had announced that they were separating the men and the women, I was actually upset because I love competing side by side with men because I just, I love it, even though there can be some weird cycling practices that they do that I don't appreciate. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, but you know, I definitely had uh, all of those same emotions going through the race. Um, actually it's funny that you said about your swim skin. Cause I had a similar thing. I pulled my swim skin on and my swim skin actually also I have to say shout out to blue 70 cause they've done amazing for me. But like, I think that I was just bigger than they had anticipated me to be. And I ripped my swim skin right before I went into the water. Like I was pulling it up to make sure everything was good. And it ripped oh, in the oh. front. It ripped in the front. I was like, I feel like I would have been totally fine if this ripped in the butt because like it's acceptable to have a big butt, but it actually ripped in the stomach. And I was like, oh my God. Not the greatest way to start a race, probably, no. I just looked at Mike and he's like, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. I'm like, it is this big. <laughs> Well, it is funny. It's, I mean, trying to size those things is crazy. I got a Roka one and my husband got me an extra small because my wetsuit's an extra small. And when he, we went back and looked at the pounds on there, it started for my height, it was 92 to 105 pounds. So he was like trying to bounce me in it like a sausage. And I was like, I'm going to divorce you if you try to shove me in this thing. So order a size up, damn it. <laughs> yeah. I, yes, it definitely, there is definitely different sizes, wetsuit versus swim skin. I learned that five minutes before the race. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it out okay. I was glad that you were near me as we exited. That was a, a kind of a, a nice familiarity there. So I appreciate your, your charging through that transition because I was like, all right, snap into it, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was, you know, for for preparing for the race to kind of like share people. I mean, what were you thinking that was going to happen in the race that you like ended up having to switch? Because I definitely know that that happened a lot. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of uh, the main thing I was worried about was swimming over the older women. Um, and just everyone in the water has a sense of anxiety, I think, cause it's a world championship race. So 
it wasn't even that it was, I mean, it was physical, but when you went by women, it was like, they would just convulge on you and, and come on to you. And it was just like, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. So that was expected that I had to work through that. And everything in terms of pacing on the swim, I was like, yeah, that's about what I expected. It's still pretty slow if I want to get better. You know what I mean? It's the first thing I need to work on. But I did not expect hail. I did not expect hail at all. And so... I, yeah, on the bike. So, uh, and me and Carolyn were together on that for, you know, us probably, thir- th- what, 30 miles? We were together on that. So, you know, that helped me in terms of pacing and the fact that she didn't stop. And I was like, well, you know, they're, they're, they will let us, there's enough people out here. Well, they will let us know if it, the race is called. So, I mean, you wouldn't want to look back on the day and be like, well, I gave up and they told us not to, you know, everyone kept going. So that was the main thing was kind of snapping into go drive there. But uh, knowing, knowing Carolyn kind of just a little bit beforehand and then being like, well, you know, her and I are going to work together on this. So it kind of gave me a little bit of goosebumps, a little bit of adrenaline rush just to be like, I can, let's go like, all right, let's just lean into it. I mean, literally lean into it because I looked up and Carolyn was at a 45 degree angle on her bike and we were riding disc wheels, which catch the wind a ton. So I kind of was watching her do it. People know like I'm five, two. How tall are you? Same. Yeah. So we're, we're mini and that kind of (laughs) stuff is like, Oh, here's the wind. (laughs) Like we're the kind of people that could just get blown off of your bike. Yeah, and so I I actually shifted into a, just a larger gear set just to kind of almost mentally just be like push push push, and I did. I think you even mentioned this too. Like we were putting the hammer down right there, um, and the other part of me just thought, well, I know some girls are probably going to give up right here, so if I can capitalize on on girls that are going to kind of give up, that's an advantage. Um, but I was just surprised we didn't crash because, I mean, you saw me. I mean, I was passing people on the right because p- the wind was blowing people to the left. And I don't know. I was just trying to survive that part. Um, so that the hail was unexpected. But that was everything else. I think I know that that course is really hard. So, yeah, there, it was just fortitude. You know, I will say this. I felt like it was almost palpable when that wind hit coming out back up the 3000 street. Like I could sense people were like, oh, they were, I don't know if we were speeding up or slowing down, but I felt like a majority of people almost took it down a gear. Did you feel like that too? Because we passed a lot of people like as soon as that wind popped up. Yeah, a lot of people just sat up on their bars and I just felt like you should completely do the opposite. I'm like, the more you can push that front wheel down and just lean onto it and keep pedaling to keep that disc wheel on the ground. Uh, I felt like that was the biggest thing. So as long as no one knocked into me that, you know, it was going to be fine. And when we went by the first grouping of like police officers and they just were like cheering for us, I was like, they're not, they would have radioed to them to have a stop. So, so yeah, that was kind of my, that was my game plan at that point. (laughs) Well, you know, I, I was just, you know, that was a quite a moving, memorable moment in the race. Definitely. Um, there, with you on the the bike and you are an incredible runner. I mean, I am just blown away by your fortitude. Tell us a little bit about your run experience because you know, you had a hell of a bike ride and you got off the bike and you crushed it. Yeah. I was surprised when I knew that my husband started an hour and a half before me, which beforehand thinking I was like, okay, this is the first time I'm going to have you on the run. So I knew if I could just get to my husband, I would feel happy. And I had told him all week, I just don't want, anything to happen in terms of a mechanical on the bike. I I've talked to a lot of ladies after, I mean, so many people got flats. Apparently I don't, I don't know. It seems like every female got a flat, but I had no, I I just wanted to get through without a flat. And I was like, obviously I've got outcome goals, but process wise, if I can get to that run, I know I'm going to be safe and nothing will stop me from crossing the finish line, even if I have to walk it in. So an overwhelming sense of joy hit me when I got off the bike and my husband was waiting for me right there. And I was I mean, just knowing myself, I was like, I, I was very quiet about what I wanted going into it. Um, so he was like, you're third, you're in third place. And I was like, great, because I knew I could just play defense then. So when he told me I was in third, I was like, great. If I move up, awesome. But I mean, that that hailstorm, it did zap me. I'm sure you felt it too. And then that big climb at the end of the bike zapped me. So I was like, just do not 
uh, put any pressure, extra pressure on yourself, you know, like your body's going to do what it can do and you have to trust your training. And I was nervous getting off my bike. Everyone knows those first few steps before you put your shoes on. You're like, wow, these are cement filled legs. Um, so I was happy. I was really happy to see my husband. Uh, I felt really queasy. Uh, my stomach felt really nauseous. Uh, just kind of, I think just the emotions of everything. And, you know, we had a really late start. I'm a, I'm a habit girl and I'm sorry, but noon is lunchtime. So I was like, Oh gosh, I'm so hungry. I don't want gel. I don't want Gatorade. Uh, so I was just like, just get through this and you can have like pizza or something. Right. But, uh, yeah, I usually move up on the run a, a position or two, depending on how I'm feeling. And I felt highs and lows just like every race, but I really tried to ignore my watch because that course will punish anybody that is pace focused. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, it's a slow run. You're like, you're not going to have a record breaking run. Um, so I didn't, I don't even, I still haven't looked back at my mile splits, but I just was like, you know, I tried to encourage every woman that I saw out there. Cause I felt, I mean, I don't know how you have been Carolyn, but, uh, when I first started in Arizona, there's a catty group of women that run in the triathlon crowd and they were major, uh, which is to me at the beginning. And I was like, I'm not interested in any of that. You know what I mean? And I, I felt a really big sense of camaraderie from the women, uh, you know, starting with you and then moving just through the, the run. I just was like, you know what? People are going to remember you out here if you were nice and if you were throwing a temper tantrum or feeling bad. Um, so I tried to encourage every female, depending, I mean, where I was, if I was going up that steep section of the hill, I was like, every ounce of energy is going to be on moving forward. But um, when it rained on us, right around, I don't know, mile five or six, I was like, thank God, this is amazing. Um, and that was a huge, big plus moment for me. Then you run back into town, everyone's there, it's great. And then you're like, okay, I just got to get through miles eight through 10, just got to get through miles eight through 10. And once I got to mile like 10.5, I was in really bad shape. My legs felt awful. But then thankfully, it's that kind of downhill. It's almost too downhill where you could like <laughs> somersault your way to the finish. Yes. yes. Um, and I saw a guy slip and fall there cause it was obviously wet and slick and they were cr crying for like medical. One girl stopped right in front of me to go help him. And I was like, move it or lose it. sister. Yes. <laughs> I will be the next one down. If you stay, <laughs> if you cut me off like that. But, uh, I kept my cool and, and just kind of that one of the girls that I know, Rachel, I think she was, she bombed by me at that point. So I was like, God, fuck. And, uh, just kind of try to get to the finish line, uh, from that point on. But I mean, it's good to see the level of women out there because some women ran 10 minutes faster than I did out there, which is just nuts, you know? So it's incredibly humbling, but nuts. And, and I wanna yeah. know in a nutshell, yeah, in a you? nutshell, I'd say it's just about putting one foot in front of the other on that course. And just, I was the only person running on the second loop up that hill. Oh, so yeah. that was hard. D did you have a plan going into it for your run? Because I heard you say, you know, you can't really do pace there. Did you plan to maybe do pace? You plan to run heart rate, maybe run feel, uh, maybe run just for the next person in front of you and keep doing that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and what's so hard about all these waves is like, there were, there, there's men out there that have been out there for two hours already. Right. So, and they're walking the aid stations and that's just annoying. Right. But, um, yeah, I wanted to break 90 minutes. Um, and I knew right away that I wasn't going to, <laughs> I knew right away. Uh, I don't race with heart rate. Um, uh, I train with it, but my husband looks at it and I don't. Um, so yeah, I'm a pretty pace focused person usually. Uh, but as soon as I saw my first kind of, I, I mean, I saw my first mile off the bike and I was like, well, if you're not going to hit it on the first mile, you're not going to hit it in the last mile. So, uh, I gave up that almost immediately and was like, you know, who cares? You know, if, if you finish this race and your half marathon splits three hours, guess what? People are still going to love you. And most people don't even know what the difference is. So I kind of just tried to really find joy to keep me moving forward. I was like, even if you have to walk it in, you're going to get that medal. You know what I mean? And I, I've seen my husband's world championship gear and I really wanted it. So, um, I think just trying to really hold on to the positive things about that, you know, and my husband did give me an update on the starting the second loop that I moved into second. So, Really, I was just overjoyed at that point. So I really felt like I could rely on instincts. And uh, he's a phenomenal runner. His strength is the run. So he's coached me, I think, leading into this where I could really just, that's pace is there, go by pace, right? And, and, and let that motivate you. But, but ultimately, let your body be the driver. 
Um, and that's what I did. I just let, I let it go completely by, by feel at that point. And it's when you run by a female, you don't know what age group they're in because they didn't do age group markings. So yeah, it was all about just finding positive positivity when you could and, you know, letting out the occasional swear word when you're in pain, if you needed to. (laughs) I hate to say it, but yeah. yeah. I totally understand that. Yeah, the aid stations were a massive issue. I I actually planned to have, like, I never run with a little water bottle, but I took a teeny tiny one because I knew that aid stations were going to be congested. And I'm like, okay, I can fill it up every three aid stations. I can make my way through and just... Yeah, um, that's smart. Deal with that. <laughs> yeah. No, and but, that was smart. Um, well, congratulations to you. That was super fun being able to share that moment um, with you out on the course, several moments. So that was really, really fun for me. So congratulations. Yeah, same for me too. Yeah, that was awesome. I, I do want to know, you know, getting second in your age group in the world championship. Yeah, that just gives me goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, there, there's not a lot of room to move up. There is one. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what is your plan after that? I mean... Are you like, all right, next year's first is mine? Are you, hey, I'm I'm aging up and I got to win that one now? That's me. I'm the pro? only one. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to leave that one to Carolyn. Yeah, that's yeah. all Carolyn for sure. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There was a couple things going into this, right, where – uh, this year, coming off of 2020, it was, you know, 2020 would have been my last year in the 25-29 age group, which I think is just as competitive as 30-34, if not more competitive in the half iron distance. So um, I would have I would have liked to have, you know, I would have liked to have my last year in that. Um, but going into this year, there was a couple of things that I, I, I had to check off my personal list. Like, I wanted to get an overall win, right? And I came really close at Oregon, but... That got kind of robbed for me, so I was really butthurt about that and all that because if I would have won that and then finished where I did, I would have been a lot more tempted to go pro, but um, there's there's a combination of things. So, I mean, obviously, I could have gone pro after St. George um, in May with my overall placement, third overall placement, second age group there. Um, but I, I did get chipped, um, in Oregon and I didn't quite get the age group win there. So I I would like to win a race overall. Um, and that world champion Jersey, I don't know if you saw that. I mean, that is a sweet Jersey. So that's tempting. Yeah. And just the fact that, I mean, there are some class act age groupers, right? And even the girl that won, we outswam her, but she beat us on the bike. And I mean, her bike run was amazing to be beat 20 by 20 minutes in the bike and run is just completely completely humbling because i've always been like oh i can't go pro because I, I won't make the chase back so what's it matter if what i can bike and run um so i think it just solidified the hunger for me to be an even better amateur uh because there's plenty of competition out there in the amateur field and that's just what i like i like to engage in a race um i i felt like carol and i were engaging in a race for sure and that there were women we we biked our way kind of to the clear spots up front where it wasn't until mile 50 that a girl came bombing by me. I'm like, that's the other level. That's the next level. And I couldn't go with, right? Um, so I think for me, it just solidified that, yes, I'm very talented. And, yes, I have potential. Um, and I'm at the top of the sport, one of them. Yeah, but uh, there are other women that can still kick my ass, you know, 10 times to Sunday. Um, so I'm hungry to be a little bit more engaged at the front of the race uh, in terms of the, the age group field. But shoot, it's just so hard at the way that they run them. You know, I really wish they were mass starts because of that. I mean, those 25, 29 girls started 15 minutes behind us. And those are the girls I really need to race. Right. So I'm in a big mixed bag of emotions. I'm in a glass case of emotion (laughs) actually after the whole thing. Um, and I get, you know, it's, it's hard to be on social media or even just knowing people because everyone's got an opinion about what you should do. Right. And, it comes down to what you are going to experience and love the most. And I love lining up with my husband and racing. Like Carolyn said, I love racing the boys. It's really fun. Um, and I would miss that. So I do think I'm going to do another year of amateur racing. Um, and just, yeah, just try to keep improving every year, year over year improvement. And if all signs point to professional racing, 
I will, I will take that jump, but I am filled with anxiety at the thought of lining up in a pro field. Like, oh my goodness, I do struggle with anxiety a lot. So I just think I would improve more without any pressure to do X, Y, and Z. Cause at that point, I mean, triathlon is really predictable, right? I mean, you knew within 10 minutes what you were going to finish. So I don't expect any miracles to happen over winter time where it's like, oh yeah, it's going to be so fun racing pro like no i mean it'll be pretty brutal and i will be middle of the pack at best um so yeah long long-winded answer but that's probably what i'm thinking of your amateur yeah with competitors like both of you in the age group no shame racing an age group i mean that is incredibly <laughs> well, hard to still win that <laughs> yeah it is yeah i i just think it's incredible i mean every year you you can't help but be inspired by other people doing the incredible things that they are. I mean, I've seen women that are like, I'm like, Oh, that they're doing okay. And then suddenly they have this like almost growth spurt in triathlon. I'm like, Holy, how the hell did they do that? <laughs> and, and it's, you know, you have those aha moments all the way through your career. And I love watching everybody's journey because it makes you look at every other athlete and go, if they can do it, I can do it. And I think that that is a huge part of what drives my personal growth is then I look at other competitors like yourself, you know, there's a lot of other age group women out there um, that I'm like, man, you know, we talked to Liza Rochetto yesterday and I'm like, you know, she's battle, she battles rheumatoid arthritis and she races pro cycling. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> what? What? You know, and it's, it's just things like that. And again, she said it very well. It's kind of Iron Man's motto is anything is possible. And I, I love being inspired by the age group athletes and, you know, they're, they're beating pros out there too. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I mean, I beat a couple too, and we had way harder conditions. Like you can't even, that was what was so hard about the day too. I think the, the age group that got it the best, I hate to say it, if there's anyone else, 30, 34 men, they were climbing snow Canyon. That was the best possible scenario that you could have had at, when that storm hit. So even every age group had a different advantage or disadvantage with that storm. So when I got the response from Iron Man that they're like, oh, we want it all to be a fair race. And I was like, no, I mean, what, if anything, that, that weather and that course, it really separated certain age groups. And yeah. it's just, it's so hard to really call it a race unless you're a pro, unfortunately. Don't, don't measure my time against the men's because they obviously had an advantage. Well, like I mean, the, against the other age group women's too. You yeah, guys were separated mm -hmm. over an hour. You couldn't say necessarily, you oh, know, yeah. the, winner of a certain age group you couldn't even compare them to the winner of another age group yeah exactly mike that's a really good point yeah a different race all the way through and you know again this is i don't know if you know this did you hear they pulled 80 women out of the water i wrote to them about that and i was like you can't take a day away and they were of course there were the people they they screwed over the most right the women that were probably already the most pissed off i mean i would have been like i will never race for you guys again like that is just the most because they trained for that you can't take that i mean then they don't get a of entry into next year or a refund i'm sorry that doesn't do it there's no dollar amount you can put on training for and lining up for that race yeah yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I feel like I heard a little bit of this, but I'd love to hear if you, you know, if you were God and you had, or let's just say something lower, you were the president of Iron Man. Yeah. <laughs> and you had the option to go ahead and set, uh, set the swim weight in your <laughs> field. This is Are such you a controversial out? thing. Women 30 to 34 first, then everybody else? Or? <laughs> 100%. Yeah. How you do it. I mean, and it's, it's, I, and I do give the organization credit in the fact that, I mean, I've done some small race directing before and it's super, a super tough job, but yeah. uh, I would go, I, and, and I know it's impossible because the younger age groups are massive. I would go men, 18 to 24, women, 18 to 24, men, 25, 29, women, 25, 29. Yeah. I mean, and if you really want the, the, what my husband and I think, mass starts and if you if you pass away i mean that's the main i would i my my ultimate heart says mass starts yeah but i know it'll never happen <laughs> mike said optional mass start and then an age group wave all the way back yeah i think that that's the main why and I, I have a good friend that works for iron man and i said can you please put in a word that if you want to take an age group or overall award you have to start in a mass elite wave start so pros go off Mass start elite wave and then age group rolling starts for everybody else. Start men's elite and then women's elite and then go. Oh, interesting. That it's the kind cool. of an in between. Mm -hmm. Wonder, are you, would that be 
like personally identified? Would it be based on your, I don't know what well, uh, people know races? I think people know when they're going for a top five spot, like, I've I was going for one, top I... <laughs> <laughs> never... Yeah. Going for. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Like the other thing, the other, th- the other thing we did, we did talk about was, uh, you know, you take your best 70 and discluding river swims, you take your best 70.3 time and then they seed it that way. Uh, okay. but I know that's just a lot of data to sort through too, but you, and you'd have to exclude river swims, you know what I mean? But that's another way to do it. I mean, I wish they could break it into categories like cycling in some ways where it's like cat one and two and three and four and five, but I don't know. I think it actually starts at the local level. If I'm being honest, I think that local racing, we need to get a breath of fresh air into local racing and then local races need to set the president and say, yeah, we do mass starts, so now, you know what I mean? I think it it, it, it has to it kind of have, since it did have a grassroots beginning, the sport's yeah. just changing, and I don't think Ironman of, of any brand is keeping up with the times very well, and I think everyone that races for them knows that. They really prioritize pros and, and age group men. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's there's, there's a couple different ideas, but I think that they need to start tossing a few of them around the boardroom, meeting rooms there. Their current yeah. plan isn't very successful. <laughs> I think there's a lot of way to collect data. I mean, Mike in our organization is a data junkie and he knows how, I mean, yeah. he can pull out everybody's stuff and tell me everything about everybody in the race. Like I'm pretty That's sure. That's amazing. That. You can hire Mike Wilson. <laughs> um, he can. <laughs> um, yeah. Send me your race plan for next year. And <laughs> no, he's, he, yeah, she's going to start sending. She's like, I'm going to be doing, this tell me what i need to know um and then we'll get our group of men sherpas and get them husband sherpas um but let's kind of switch gears a little bit and i want to hear um about um what's kind of intrigued you like what's a race that you've always wanted to do in triathlon like dream like dream race Where we ever since uh I started getting into it. I mean, something about Lake Placid in New York, I, I think it's New York, yeah, has mm-hmm. kind of intrigued me. I don't know why. Like, there are probably harder courses out there, like Norseman and all that, but I hate to be cold. So, I mean, I would say that. But um, I know for a lot of people, it's about Kona, and I've just never, I hate to say that. I've never been intrigued by that race. I have sherpa it once, and it's great. It's a great energy. Um, but yeah, I'm just, maybe it's because I'm not a full distance person. I don't know. I, at least not yet. I know it's got a lot of icon around it, but Lake Placid has always drawn me for some reason. I don't know why. I, you, I, I wish I could back it up, but. They're like technically challenging courses that you like. Are you gravitated towards certain races? I do or, like a, yeah, uh, hilly bike. You What's like that? a hilly bike? Yeah. So like St. George is like so far in, in the races that I've done, I love St. George and I love, uh, Canada. That was the only full that I did. And I love Canada's course on um, that, that I like those. Cause they're both, they're hilly on both the bike and the run for sure. So she would love Lanzarote. Yeah. You would love Lanzarote, but I don't know if that's full distance. It is. Canada's yeah. I, we have a 70.3 Lanzarote. But that's yeah. not vibe. So you tell us a little bit about you said earlier that you're not not super into traveling, just kind of like to keep it stateside. Yeah, I I just I have a hard time. Fl- I don't like to fly. I have a hard time flying, and I don't like flying by bike. I just traveling. I know some people love it. If I can drive there in four hours, that's fantastic for me. Like I love to do Coeur d'Alene. That's why I love going to Whistler because we're really close there. Um, I I liked the idea of Oregon until the whole river swim extremely flat. I mean, it's okay, but, um, I, I should go to California more, but I do. I like to, I like a, I like a race weekend where it's like Thursday through Sunday and then I'm back to my normal routine. I think I'm just very type A. That's probably the main thing. I know it sounds terrible, but I don't like time zone changes. I like, you know, I don't like to be thrown off and that's, that's, I'm sure a lot of triathletes can relate to that though. A hundred percent. And I, I think it's good to hear, um, different perspective because Mike and I are like totally racecation people. I'm like, let's go to Mexico. Let's go to Europe. Let's go to, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a racecation a hundred percent for us. Um, but I think that's good to hear from people like, yeah, you don't have to go all over the planet to be able to race and have a good time. Like most of these places are right in your backyard and you might not even know it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And we love where we live. We live on a little lake that's very secluded. We don't have any neighbors. You know, we've got dogs and chickens and things like that. So I just, I have a really hard time being away from home for more than like four or five days just because I start to miss all my like fur babies and like I want to feed my sourdough starter and I want to like do my composting and little things like that. It's super hippie, but um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think that's been, <laughs> that's why I, I would love to do Mexico and even like Ironman, Arizona, we can fly down there. Like my husband's going to do that in uh, a month or so, so I can jump on that. You know, I can fly down. Not, not too, you know, you can be back Thursday through Monday. It's not too bad, but yeah, I wish I was more fun. You guys sound fun. <laughs> well, you know, we are, we're always looking for people to travel with and have a good time. So if you ever change your mind, you know where we are. <laughs> I'll hit you up for sure. Um, and then, um, let's see, Mike, do you have any other questions? Uh, might, might be early, but I want to know. So what is your race schedule like for next year? Mike's like, where can we go? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is because we did shift around some of our races from this year. We were going to do Boulder this year. Um, and then when Oregon became an option, it was just less travel. Um, it was easier to get to logistically. And timing-wise, it worked better. Because my husband has obviously been, he's he's in more, involved with more Ironman. So um, if an Ironman, like Pentington got canceled. So he was signed up for Pentington. So when that got canceled, it really affected his calendar schedule, which then kind of by nature affected mine. Um, so we're going to do... Uh, he's probably going to, he's going to do Ironman St. George the fall in May and he's really trying to get me to do it, but I just, I, I'm not going to pull the trigger on that just yet because I have a hard time with falls, but, um, we'll see. Maybe, maybe I'm very non-committal there yet, but I'll definitely be sherping for him. Um, we're for sure in Victoria, um, 70.3, Coeur d'Alene 70.3, uh, Boulder 70.3 and hopefully then World 70.3. Gonna do Victoria? Is it back? I think so. Yeah, we were able to sign up. Okay, excellent. Do you have a deferral for that? No, you've already used all your deferral. Anyway, I'm like, where, where are we going? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's yeah. here. And um, then we do a lot of local races. So we hit all the local races in our area. So we usually do about four local races, and then I like to do some uh, local bike, like road bike races and stuff too. So. Yeah, that kind of rounds it out usually uh, for me. But then if I throw a full in there, then I got to play around with maybe doing a full. And then, you know, the the consequences of doing a full potentially will we'll put a dot, dot, dot there, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the tentative plan for now. OK, very cool. Um, yeah, sounds like a fun, fun 2022 plan for you guys. I know it's weird to say that. I feel like it wasn't even really 2021. It's, you know what I mean? So I think 2022, it just feels like a big time warp, but yeah, hopefully you guys do some of those. If not, I mean, for sure, Coeur d'Alene, right? Cause you guys are in Idaho. Actually, I've never done Coeur d'Alene. He's done it. I've done the 70.3. Yes. I yeah. had a, um, I had somebody ask me if I was doing Iron Kids a couple years ago and I was like, uh, I'm <laughs> 33 years old. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> God bless, bless up, honey. <laughs> she had an extra small bike. <laughs> you need to keep that extra small swim skin that but you know we were you know trying yeah. to get everybody it's like <laughs> I still think she could have taken overall. <laughs> oh for sure, for sure. I should have done iron kids. I'm pushing children out of the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like the Grinch and when he's doing the hacky sack at the end, he's knocking kids over. That would have been you and doing Iron Kids. Yeah, it's my moment. Can I? At no, at you know, no cost is too big to get to the front of that finish line for sure. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna push people out of my way, elbow them. No, I'm kidding. I would never do that. You kind of had that look though, coming down the finishing shoot yeah. at Worlds. You were like, you were ready. You were dropping some elbows if anyone came in your way. I saw it. I don't know if you noticed that precariously placed um, aid station that was like for second loopers, but it was definitely like right in the way of coming down to the finish shoot. And I was told this girl to move. God bless you, woman, whoever you were out there. But I was like, please move. And she definitely <laughs> just kind of like shoved her out of my way because she, she's like, you I think it's obvious, like I'm coming on your left, but I could also understand how the aid station is also on her left. So she wouldn't hundred percent know where to go. And a yeah. spectator started yelling at her and he's like, get out of the way. She's trying to win. I was like, 
God bless that, that, per- yeah. But really, I mean, don't you agree that there needs to be some kind of, like, if you're going to walk, because I encourage all my athletes to walk aid stations, so it's probably traumatizing for them when they have somebody like us coming through, but I feel like there needs to be some kind of, like, walking lane, because when people are running and you're pacing, like, behind their run and, like, timing it and they start walking, like, I feel like that's another thing where it's, like, a walking lane would be great. Right. Well, they should have, like, last two aid stations or for walkers and, like, front two aid stations are for runners or something. Actually, that is a very, very good idea. I can see his brain moving right now. I know, Mike, get on it. (laughs) Yeah, I I do. Crunch the numbers. Because you definitely don't want to hurt anybody or like offend anybody. We're trying to have a fun day and you kind of get like jostled if somebody's like, F out of here. And you're like, "Ah." (laughs) yeah, because it's nothing. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I definitely encourage people to do it. It's just a matter of logistics, you know what I mean? It's just there's only so many. I mean, then you then you run by that pro table that had their own stuff, and I was like, God, yes, maybe I need to do that. Water over there, like, what's I know. Yeah. Next time I'm gonna text some of my friends and be like, when you're done with your race, go back to your pro table and put something because we have some good friends that are obviously. I mean, they're not world championship level, but they got their own bathrooms. So my husband and I came over and I was like, we're gonna use your pro bathrooms, and they're like. <laughs> don't embarrass us you guys and I was like oh oh I know we're so lowly us amateurs you know so we're always giving them crap about their own bathrooms and things like that so the treatment must be nice yeah exactly I would love it if Iron Man oh my gosh I could go on to like a million tangents so yeah. I'm not going to we can go let's let's continue here to about you because I loved you know number one us athletes most of us, 99.9% of us are coffee addicts. So I obviously wanted to ask you some fun questions. How do you take your coffee? For sure. I'm definitely in the morning. I'm a bear until I get my just hot black coffee. Like I have to have that. I love it. Very strong. Got to be strong. Uh, And then I usually have, especially when I'm training pretty heavily, I like to have something in the afternoon. Like I have my own espresso. So either have a shot of espresso or an oat milk, like a homemade oat milk latte. But one of those two, it's that's the way to my heart right there is coffee or a latte and oat milk latte. (laughs) Yes, yes. I'm right there with you. 100% with the oat milk. I'm addicted. Yes. And I must have both. Like I have to have both on, a, on an average day. During race week, I usually take the afternoon one out just so that I really kind of up my caffeine sensitivity for the race morning. But uh, yeah, every other every other time it's it's two a day for caffeine. Do you take coffee race morning? I do. Yep. So, right. Yep. Got to have that. Got to yeah, get that. Gotta- the only legal stimulant you can get away with, I have to, to capitalize on it. Yeah, that's for awful. sure. Yeah, that's why nobody can sleep after an Iron Man because they're jacked up on caffeine gels and Red Bull. Everybody's I, like, yeah. Oh. And I did throw. I did. I did. Um, I had did to go to the medical after I did throw up, and I I was getting. I was checking my bike out, and I just like started stumbling, and I threw up gels everywhere. Like I did, and so then I had everyone come over. I was like, oh, so embarrassed. I felt like I was at a party. Someone was like. Some girls like rubbing my neck and a guy was putting a water bottle on me. I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm in college right now. Like, just give me to a shady tree, everybody. <laughs> Rough. I know. They definitely needed to have an ice bath of a sort. Yes. Yes. That would have been great. And then I think um, one of our last questions is what is your favorite book? I mean, I read often and I, if I had to go back, the only ones I, like a favorite movie, favorite book, I feel like it's something you can revisit and come back to. It's not a one and done. You know what I mean? Um, like Inception's a great movie, but you can only watch it once because you know what happens. So in terms of like movies and books, you can't go wrong with like Harry Potter and uh, like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit because you can reread them and you can rewatch them and kind of go on a different journey every time and different imagery and things like that. So definitely good bike bike material is the movies and then yeah i love reading the hobbit's a great book it's just a great it's a very well written book i love the hobbit so yeah Yeah. love that hero journey for sure every time Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and then what is your current favorite song because obviously a ton of us listen to music so you know what can we add to our playlist um i like fancy like uh that's my it's a country song about it's like it's on the applebee's commercials yeah so and of course after one of my races this year i won a hundred dollars and the first thing my husband's like what do you want to do and i said take i want to go to applebee's so we went to applebee's with my prize money so i guess it's a cheap date (laughs) heck yes i love that yeah i do really like that song you know i feel like you 
I have a mixture of like Disney, country, rap, pop, classic even. I'll throw that in there. I just, it all really, really. You need all the stimulus. The different things, different days, for sure. I feel that. I feel that. Yes. Um, Well, if there's, if there's the last question that we'll probably have for you today, if there's anybody struggling for motivation out there, what is one piece of advice that you would give them to help pick themselves up and get them back hitting the pavement again? Yeah. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got athletes that really struggled with COVID and I work with a swim team. I saw a lot of teenagers that really had mental health issues come to light. And, you know, it's something we're still working with. Obviously it was a really hard time, a lot of unexpected chaos for everybody, but I just try to tell people, you know, in in terms of, of motivating yourself for exercise, I always ask myself, you know, would you feel better if you didn't do it? Or would you feel better if you did something? And, um, a lot of times I think we just need to take the expectation out. So just kind of imagine how you feel like on those days when you don't want to go swim, right? But then you just feel guilty if you didn't or if you didn't just go for a walk, you know what I mean? So sometimes it's like, all right, well, maybe we don't do that run, but we take our dogs out for a walk or we call our parents and and just go sit outside and be in nature. And if you're still really struggling to get yourself to do something, whether that's, you know, people that are in bodybuilding or weightlifting or cycling and and if you're just hitting your head against the wall for like months at a time it's it's probably time to find something different so it doesn't really matter what the stimuli is it's it's the fact that as human beings we need that stimuli to grow and we need challenge and failure and success all at one time to grow so I guess it's several things but my main thing is I always tell myself you know, picture how you feel before and after, whether you do it or you don't. And most people would prefer how they feel after they move their bodies. And so finding the right stimuli and the right source of, of challenge that's going to allow you to fail and grow and then also succeed. I think that's the t- ticket to success, whether that's power walking or rowing or bodybuilding. It just has to fit you and it has to bring you joy. If you, if you don't have joy in what you do, I mean, it's going to be hard to be motivated for that, you know? So yeah, find joy and, and just, just move your bodies. You know what I mean? So that's, that's my main message to, to anyone for sure. That's great. And yeah, enjoy what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so Becca, if people want to, you know, follow you and, you know, track you over this next year in your races, get in touch with you, where would they do that? And if you have Facebook, Twitter, how, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, the Ironman Tracker is a great way to follow us for sure. Um, and then I'm I'm not on, the only social media I'm on is uh, is Instagram as Kaoka Coaching. Um, that's just kind of my coaching page. Sometimes I'll put like, obviously my dogs and chickens and stuff on there. But a lot of times it's just, you know, workout tips and uh, updates. And I, I share, I guess we have a YouTube page too. Um, it's under my husband's name, Elliot Kaoka. Um, and that's all my, uh, mobility sessions. I, I film one a week usually and post that. So it's often, you know, swim specific mobility, cycling mobility in season, out season training for triathletes, stuff that I I'm doing that kind of helps both my athletes and, and my good friends, if they're struggling, it's sometimes good to have a 20 to 30 minute voice to lead you through. So probably either Ironman tracker, Instagram, or YouTube is how you can find me for sure. So yeah, thanks for the shout out. And, uh, I really appreciated being on here with you guys. It's nice to get to know you. You, you guys are a power couple for sure. So I'm going to be looking for y'all out there too this the next year. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll, I'll have to give you splits next time I see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that'd be great. Then on your all your success, thank you so much for joining us on the uh, race recap with Big Mike and the Pixie. We'll Yay. see you guys. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll stop the.